Okay, good morning, everybody. Now we shall start. And today lectures will be the part of uh, uh, the school physics of life. And uh, a little bit attention will be paid on the biological oscillators. Uh, I am Angelka Hedrick uh, from um, Mathematical Institute of Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts. And today uh, I will talk about uh, biological oscillators and exactly, uh, especially two examples of it because uh, <clears throat> it's a really wide area of research and uh, uh, you can really find a, a lot of papers regarding each uh, sector of, of uh, human or any kind of biological system uh, as an oscillator. Okay, I'm uh, my background, I'm a medical doctor but I got a PhD in uh, biomedical engineering and uh, technology. So that means that I pass through some steps like uh, uh, cooperation with uh, scientists from different fields and uh, with the multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary um, cooperation and interaction. So I would like to share some of my experience regarding that uh, multidisciplinarity. Okay, but before that, uh, uh, what, uh, what is also very interesting and important for you as a theoretical physicist uh, is uh, to make the mathematical models uh, in the, of biological systems if you want to feel, uh, work in the field of, uh, of biology. And there are some problems regarding uh, working in this field. Uh, first uh, problem is, uh, as I say, multidisciplinarity. And uh, uh, yesterday we have some uh, questions about is it really possible to understand each other if you are from the different uh, educational background and from different completely different area of science like for example could one physicist uh, medical doctor uh, and uh, electroengineering and uh, for example physical chemists or biologists understand each other if they want to uh, do some together research uh, uh, on any kind of biological system. Uh, well, uh, it is possible, but it's not so easy. And uh, it's not easy in a way to find people who will, are uh, willing to cooperate. So the first thing is to find people who are uh, open for experience, who uh, want to cooperate. And then uh, after you pass that step, uh, all other things are much, much easier. Uh, first thing that you can understand is uh, that uh, we are all, let's say, focused to our approach of the same problem. For example, if we have a cell, biologists will look uh, it uh, as a biological object that is alive, that could be killed, that could be seen through the uh, microscope, that you can uh, uh, reproduce it in the cell culture, uh, multiply, and so on. But uh, physical chemist, for example, will be interested for the same system uh, uh, of uh, chemical reactions and they are, uh, how they are connected and what is the input, the first product and the uh, end of the products after the system of uh, 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 different uh, chemical reactions. So he will deal with the same system, but on a different way. And uh, for example, um, uh, electro engineering will see the cell as a, as a uh, conductor or as a electrical. Uh, 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 for example, if you connect many cells, you can you can uh, treat it as a, uh, uh, connected capacitators or or uh, for example, if you have a muscle cell of the neurons, you will treat it like. A, um, electrical wire or electrical circuit. Yes, electrical circuit. So it's a different approach. Uh, and uh, uh, let's say uh, the medical doctor will also think about if he's uh, from the uh, area of genetics, what are the genetical basis of that? Is this health, health, uh, cell healthy or it has some kind of chromosome aberrations or uh, uh, numerical, doesn't matter. So this is all the different aspects of the same system. 
And what is also important that the biological systems are very complex systems. So the complexity is one thing that it's really uh, interesting and uh, fascinating to explore. But also in order to understand the system, we have to divide it into many, um, in many aspects actually. But in the end, to understand the system, you have to connect all the knowledge together again. So that is why very important, actually, why it's uh, so much uh, trendy, let's say, that kind of multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity. Uh, and what is also, uh, but in, uh, if you want to model certain aspects of the, of the system, uh, you need to do the, the simplifications and approximations of your model. And uh, in that kind, as a physicist, you will use equations and some um, phenomena already exist in the theory of physics, in, any, in, in the whole field of physics. So uh, what is the point? Uh, physics, uh, physics is a very interesting uh, field of science because it can cover everything. So uh, in a um, theory mode of uh, phenomenological mapping, you can use the same equations to explain different processes, especially different processes in the biological systems. But what is important to use the right one and that these equations have some kind of biological meaning. So it is not just the math that you can do in a, a virtual space, but also these equations have to represent the, the, the um, let's say natural, the force of the nature, the law of the, of the system that will be applicable for most of the time. And uh, uh, in that case, <laughs> I would like to, I remember one, one joke regarding mathematical biologists. It goes like that, like this. So uh, there was a mathematical biologist on the, some mountain and he saw uh, a shepherd taking care of the sheep, and he said to him, uh, if I uh, guess how, man, how many sheep you have on this, uh, uh, meadow, you will give me one of your, your ships. And he said, okay, it's okay. And he said, you have 20,000 ships. Wow, he was completely astonished, exactly because every shepherd has to count each ship and to return it to, the, to home. And uh, uh, the mathematical biologist uh, take uh, one of the animal and put it like on the, his neck and go away. And uh, the shepherd then uh, told him, uh, you, are, you must be mathematical biologist. And then he was really surprised how one simple, stupid shepherd could uh, 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 guess what is, what is he by his um, uh, education. And he asked him, how do you know that? It's, it's impossible. Well, you're carrying my dog. So <laughs> I want to tell you, that uh, in many cases, mathematical biologists are completely have no clue what are their model. So they, uh, what are their, their modeling? So they know the equations, they know uh, the boundary conditions, the results, uh, the limitations and everything, but they have no clue what are their model. I would like to, let's say, uh, pay, to pay attention to you not to do that. So, because it's not a good way to understand the science. So you have to make an effort to at, uh, at least 10% understand what you're modeling. And uh, that means that you have to cooperate uh, with the, let's say, biological part of your team. And at the first, to, to know what are the, the, the terms you are using for the same thing. So that is the, the crucial to have the keywords, the, the different keywords for the same thing, and then we'll understand each other. So um, also uh, when, as the model is the simplification of uh, some biological system or the process, uh, no matter if it's a healthy system or a system in disease, um, it has its limitations. And when you write the papers, and describe your system, you uh, have to tell the readers what is the limitation of your system and what will be, for example, the future uh, 
how, how, you, how you can overcome these limitations in the next step. So nobody uh, can create uh, in one moment the best, the perfect model. So there is a time that you, uh, let's say, improve your model step by step, and it's okay. So nobody will blame you because your model is not perfect. Okay, regarding the accuracy of the model, uh, I would like to mention some papers, which are, let's say, they are good uh, in a way they did everything methodologically correct. So this is one example uh, regarding, but what is the problem? I will tell you at the end, just uh, you see pictures. You see. Uh, this is a matrix uh, where you put your tissue that you produce uh, in the lab. It is very dense tissue and it is, you produce actually artificially uh, the, the cancer tissue of some kind. Doesn't matter this moment what but you make it too dense, and uh, then you uh, do the uh, research on the dense, dense tissue regarding the perfusion uh, of some drugs and uh, how this tissue will react uh, uh, regarding uh, the concentration of the drug you, uh, you put in. Uh, is it going to be destroyed on what places and to find the equations for the perfusion in the modeling part. But what is not correct in this, so tumor on a chip also is one of, of uh, um, okay. So what is not correct in this uh, experiment? Although many money was put in this and uh, many effort was put also in this for all the researchers, uh, you got the nice photos and uh, no nice uh, pictures. And this, uh, let's say, it's good for someone uh, who is financing your uh, project and to go to the ground. But those who are, uh, let's say, evaluating this, giving money, are mostly, most, in most cases, are not people who are doing science. And they don't understand this. They understand that you have colorful pictures, you do something wow, and you can postpone and got more money for to, to uh, continue your research. But the basic problem about this uh, research is because if you have such a dense tissue, uh, first, first of all, no tumors have such a kind of dense tissue because tumors firstly have uh, need uh, a very good uh, nutrition supply, very good uh, uh, vascularization and very, um, if they don't have blood, vessels inside, they would, the tumor tissue will die. So making tissues so, so dense would not firstly uh, correspond to the real situation. Secondly, it won't, uh, what is the point to make perfusion in a dense environment? Uh, the nutrition and the drugs won't come inside. So at the first time you are, uh, the, the, the main parts of, of the, the experiment are wrong at the beginning. You do not mimic the natural thing. You create artificial something which will serve for nothing. So you, all the conclusions you will get from this research won't be applicable in the future for, for the medical doctors, for the biologists to do the part, to find the pharmaceutical solution for certain tumors. And um, also the same very interesting research. So what is the point? Uh, the point is you can do that, but the conclusions are valid only for this experimental treatment. Not, you could not uh, conclude, that you could not transfer the same conclusions to the biological system. And in this thing, uh, in this paper, uh, there is a, uh, let's say tumor in a chip project that you completely artificially in the lab form the tumor tissue. And then you do the experiments on the tumor tissue you artificially produce in the lab. Here is the problem. Uh, also, you have the same conclusions only for your experimental set. Tumors in the biological systems are uncontrollable in most cases, and they adapt very quickly. They can escape uh, 
the effect of different drugs very quickly. So you have one through three cycles and a uh, patient is not responding to the drug. Like you do not give any kind of, of, uh, of me uh, medicine, any kind of drugs, but you have the side effects of drugs on the healthy tissues, you know. So this is also the question, should this model be the right, uh, uh, um, the right model for the cancer therapy and the cancer research. And of course, you can do the modeling, the theoretical one for the, this experimental setup. And that will be, let's say, uh, valid for this and similar conditions. And it's also okay. This is also the same story about the 3D bioprinting of different types of tissues and, and experiments on them. Uh, Actually, uh, 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 this was made to escape a complicated procedure of getting a live or uh, cancer tissue from the uh, pathological center or from the surgery, because you have to, in some cases, uh, for example, in Serbia, you do not need to uh, ask for the patient uh, informed consent if you use the material that is already uh, in the protocol of the treatment. So from the pathological uh, department, you can take everything you want, but uh, from, uh, the, the uh, from the surgery, before it comes goes to the pathological department, you need the informed consent of the patient. And it's time consuming, and sometimes patients for different reasons do not want to give their tissue or their are, um, extract from their bodies. So this is somehow alternative of the research, but the accuracy and the validity of the, the conclusions are very important. Uh, one very interesting uh, problem, uh, okay, it's also the problem, but uh, the example is interesting, at least for me. Uh, so uh, you got the results and they're negative. They're not what you're expected to, do, to have in the experiment, but uh, uh, you, you claim it's good and it's okay, and uh, you so somehow uh, put all the results you got in your research, but in the conclusion, uh, because it's negative, you, you, know, you somehow say it's good and it's promisable and so on. Uh, and there was, um, uh, when I start my PhD, uh, one of the idea for the PhD thesis was the sperm encapsulation uh, in order to let's say, improve the IVF treatment for infertility. So the point uh, was then uh, uh, to uh, put the sperm cells when they are fresh in the uh, beads made of uh, algina, alginate, and uh, then uh, to apply it as a artificial insemination. And the point was that the alginate, alginate will melt in a certain time points. You can uh, actually uh, program how the tick will be and how long will it need to melt to have the exact time of the ovulation and then you can then have uh, uh, have increase let's say the, the 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 percentage of successful in vitro fertilization. If I've mentioned uh, uh, some strange words, please ask me to explain. <laughs> so because I, I do not have uh, uh, knowledge. Is it strange to you? Is it familiar or, or what? Okay, so, uh, and the point is what was that you got uh, the sperm cells from the human population. I, I actually did not have from the human population. They have from pig, from cow, and uh, yeah, pig and cow, and of course was uh, these three uh, uh, species that were, uh, experiments were carried on, on that sperm. And the point was uh, you put that in a syringe and you have, uh, uh, let's say, the alginate that is also met and you mix them and you have the electrical extrusion and you make the small drops of the, of the encapsulated cells. Uh, but the point is because you use uh, natrium alginate uh, and in the uh, solution it was a calcium, uh, calcium ions, and then when they react, they are, um, the point is that that calcium not harm the sperm, but it 
does not prolong its life in, in, the, in the bead uh, because calciums are important for the sperm, um, let's say, maturation process. And if you put calcium, they will speed up their maturation process and they will be, and the point is they could not live forever. They are, have a limited uh, lifetime and uh, after, if you do not, if, if the fertilization does not happen occur in that time, they will die and you have nothing. So, uh, so the experimentally, it was not correct. And for the other thing, in order to check their uh, vitality, you have to actually melt the, the uh, alginate bead. And the point was you have to steer that and you have to wait. So you actually expose the cells uh, uh, to, uh, to the forces and actually harm them. So they leave less than uh, in the solution uh, that was already commercially available or you can mix it in the lab. So the encapsulation in that case was not the right solution for the purposes they, uh, they it was intended. To um, let's say escape that calcium, they want to. Get, uh, some of the researchers use barium ions, but actually the barium ions are, are toxic for any kind of cells, especially for the sperm cells. So um, in that series of very promising papers, in the end you have just a break and nothing after that. So um, it is very important to carefully read the papers and. Um, Especially uh, if you have to model the biological system, you need at least some basic knowledge about how it about the anatomy, about its function, and uh, to ask for the parameters that are uh, important for your equations. Are there poss is it possible to measure some of them experimentally so that you can have the right model? So the sperm encapsulation fails and, okay. Uh, yeah, this is what I want to emphasize. So the purpose of the research, is it useful, the outcome of the research for the doctors and clinicians, that kind of models, does it save money? Does it predict something that is still not uh, uh, found? And uh, the most important, is it bring the new value to the science? So there are many, uh, as we spoke yesterday on uh, in Kensin session, is it bring a new value to the science? So publishing, 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 but in some point, all that knowledge have to be synthesized in some conclusion and to make the further step. So in that moment that you have so many papers that does not bring new value to the science, you have to change the paradigm of that problem. You have to think on a different way, outside the box. And that's why it's very important to be open for experience, to hear how someone is seeing the same problem. You are here from the different countries, from the different cultural background and different, maybe not so different educational background, but that means that all of you have something that is different. That will bring the new value to the, uh, to the team and new value in the, in the end. Okay. Um, yeah. Publishing negative results. This is maybe in theoretical physics, not so uh, typical, but in uh, medicine and biology is uh, typical. So it's very important not to go that way because we know it's negative. So to find another solution. Okay, biological oscillators, finally. Uh, well, there are many examples. As I said, the biological systems are very complex and uh, typically they are nonlinear. And uh, as I said, you can use the same equations to explain different biological processes. And we have many, uh, let's say, we, we consider one human being. It is consists of many uh, cells, many systems, and they all have to, to, to work together. Like, uh, for example, uh, the biorhythm of our sleeping, the level of the hormones, the, uh, our heartbeat, 
there's also, they're all the same. The, the circulation uh, 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 of the blood, the muscle contraction, the uh, neuronic, neuron activity, they're all actually examples of, of the biological activities. So they have their phases, their amplitudes, their frequencies. And uh, of course, here we have the damping effect. As uh, Edgar yesterday mentioned, you have to put the energy in the system. So the human system is an open system. It's not perpetual mobile. mobile. Perpetual mobile, it's not. You need energy of any kind of sort. It's going to bring through the food, through, uh, and it's influence. And what is the point? It's in equilibrium, but it's dynamical equilibrium. So you have the oscillations and you have certain um, values when the system function uh, functioning it normally. So uh, if that value is down or up, a uh, system is not in the equilibrium and uh, it brings you to the disease. So uh, what you can use, uh, typically um, that oscillators that are used in modeling is a simple harmonic oscillator. The equation you already knew and the solution. And we have the frequencies uh, for the angular frequency and uh, key is a spring constant. You can also use uh, the damped harmonic oscillator. And this is the equation in this form or in this form. And damping ratio, of course. Driven harmonic oscillators also can be used, their equations in different forms. Okay, the solution. The most used one is Duffing oscillator, which can actually cover the damp harmonic and the driven harmonic oscillator. So, and this form is really typically used. Uh, what you have to find, you have to find what, what are uh, delta, alpha, and beta uh, in, this, in this context. Bam. And bam. Yes. So, it could be undamped and this, and, and have this form, or damped and has this one. Um, what is also important when you have the biological oscillators and not just biological, it is synchronization. So how they work together? Do they have uh, time delay? Uh, do they synchronize fully? Uh, what are the 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 Examples for the synchronization, as I mentioned already, is the heart rate, respiration frequency, and then muscle contraction and neuronal potential, and then hormones. Typical is this, uh, typical example for the hormones is the menstrual cycle, and you have to uh, synchronize very smoothly, very precisely, uh, different kind of hormones like estrogens, like a follicle stimulating hormone, like uh, hormones of the hypothesis. Uh, and you have the outcome on many different organs in the system. So if you do not synchronize, then you could not predict the moment of, of, of the ovulation, which is very important for, for fertilization for the future and so on. And uh, yeah, the also examples is the cell division. We've heard in Monday, uh, Eva Tolich was talking about the mitotic spindle but it is just a very complex structure that uh, uh, is very important for the cell division cycle. So without mitotic spindle, there is no cell division, but also without nucleus, it's not, we, don't have, uh, we do not have cell division. And uh, maybe at this point, I would like to emphasize that all these steps, all these phases, you know, here, 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 and finally, here when you have mechanism two cells, means that um, chromosomes and genetic material and the organelles inside have some kind of movements, have some kind of positions. Uh, I'm mentioning that now because I will tell you about uh, um, our model uh, of uh, mitotic spindle and importance why we model it on this way. Of course, model is not perfect, but the point is 
uh, the way you are here, you know, you're sitting more or less the same as the first day. This is going to happen the same story with the chromosomes. Are they going to move in the same position, exactly same, on the same way, to align, to have the same neighbors during the, these processes? We do not know that. So the arrangement of chromosomes for now, it's stochastic. And what governs these movements on this specific way, we do not know. Also, uh, what needs precise synchronization is environmental development. So, uh, and the crucial thing in this process of development is, okay, we have the DNA and some kind of program that governs all the steps precisely, what will be, what uh, will be uh, uh, done in certain phases of that development, exactly. And uh, this is, let's say, uh, the, the, the area of research of uh, bioinformatics, and bioinformatics or uh, um, genetical informatics. But still, we do not have a code. What governs this? But all, all, what we know, know uh, new till now, it's that that alignment of cells, the microenvironment of each cell, actually governs that kind of differentiation. Uh, and uh, that in this, what forces are important, not just the mechanical forces that are happening during uh, the alignment and uh, changing the position of certain cells, but also the electrical forces. The chemical um, uh, um, reactions, not just in the cell, but between interaction between many cells, uh, hormones also. So we have many events. Uh, uh, we have many events, but the same event is covered by many, uh, many fields. So uh, that's why uh, in some part of the modeling, you are talking about coupled fields. So you coupled electrical, mechanical, uh, and chemical fields at least, to explain the same process. OK, so I'm now going to talk about uh, uh, the uh, two examples of the oscillators. One is from the area of the, uh, reproductive biology uh, and the uh, interaction between uh, uh, oocyte, the female reproductive cell, and the sperm cells, the male reproductive cells. And uh, to, uh, let's say, um, explain how the dynamics between uh, their interaction could be treated as an oscillatory phenomenon. OK, uh, here what you can see uh, is uh, the outer surface of the oocyte. And yeah, what's also important before I start uh, to explain. Uh, in the natural system, oocyte is covered uh, with the, each cell has the membrane and oocyte is covered up above the membrane. There is one uh, acellular structure that is called zona pellucida, the pale zona, and um, it is some kind of a gel. Uh, and uh, um, above the zona pellucida in the natural system, you have uh, uh, other cells, they're co forming corona radiata, and they help uh, somehow in the process of fertilization. But in the lab, usually in the process of uh, in vitro fertilization, you remove the cells to increase the, uh, 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 no, to increase the, the, the chance for uh, in vitro fertilization process. Okay, but they're also important, they have some immune, uh, uh, roles and so on. And uh, so the, the uh, experiments are done on uh, uh, all sites which are, uh, in which are removed the, the cells. And uh, so the story we built for in this case. And there are many uh, uh, papers uh, that are discovered the mechanical, uh, experimentally and theoretically. Of course, uh, the, uh, they discover uh, um, the mechanical properties of zona pellucida, their 3D structure, and uh, their chemical components, and so on. So uh, what is the conclusion regarding all these uh, elements? It's uh, that the structure 
flat structure, it's net like structure. No matter if it's uh, off site of the cow, of the pig, of the human, of the mouse, of the horse, it has a more or less structure like this. And uh, it has, uh, let me see, you see the mouse that holds like this. So that means that the sperm cell, whereas this is the mouse sperm, so it has a, like this, like a hook, and it can attach to this net and it can pass the net. But, so what is also uh, the structure changes its mechanical properties during the process of maturation of the oocyte and after the fertilization. In a way, it is one, uh, uh, in a way that it uh, is first soft, it is first hard, and in the moment of fertilization, it is soft, and after the fertilization, it uh, again uh, gets hard. And uh, uh, at the moment when the oocyte, the fertilized oocyte, uh, the zygote have to attach to the uterus, it vanishes. So it escapes with some kind of catching outside. So uh, the group of scientists use uh, the um, that change in a, in a uh, uh, mechanical properties to attach a chip on the surface of the outside. So it's a microchip, you see, and it is also on the embryo, and the chip is made of silicon. Uh, during uh, what is also fascinating uh, regarding the different levels of, of uh, events uh, on the, this structure. So it the changing of the mechanical properties is actually followed by the chemical reactions they are, that are occur in order to collect molecules and synthesize them and put them in this structure. And structure actually connects, it has a lot of sulfur ties, uh, bones, uh, sulfur bones inside and so on. Um, so these are uh, some of the uh, curves that uh, represents uh, the elastical properties of uh, zona pellucida. This is in, uh, I think, in a horse. So before and after fertilization. And okay, the values are different. The methods of probing the mechanical properties are also different and so on. But the conclusions are, are like this. So uh, no matter of the value of, of uh, uh, the uh, parameters. So uh, that's why uh, uh, for my PhD thesis, I uh, came to the conclusion that it would be nice, let's say, to uh, model this structure as a net structure uh, because it resembles like, um, like a net as we saw on uh, uh, scanning uh, microscopes. Uh, and uh, that uh, we can use uh, the chain systems uh, with the molecules attached with the masses uh, to, let's say, uh, theoretically and uh, numerically discover what will be some, let's say, parameters nice to explore, like uh, uh, like a number. How will the system oscillate, the net, how will net oscillate? Uh, if it's one layer, of course, the approximations are, you will hear the approximations, or that it's one layer net. And it is vertical and connections and the uh, arrangement of molecules uh, keep the uh, molar ratio of the structure elements of the zona pellucida. So they have in mouse they have three different types of of that kind of molecules. But the point was how the system will oscillate if uh, you um, uh, put the external force and uh, you think uh, you are, uh, approximated the external force is. Uh, uh, the impact of the sperm cells, and you then can uh, vary uh, the number of the sperm cells, the uh, their frequency, and uh, the arrangement. Would these parameters influence the oscillatory state and the, the way of oscillations of this structure? Because uh, the um, we want to propose that. Actually, uh, uh, the uh, fertilization process could be considered as an oscillatory process, and that the uh, fertilization occurs in the moment when uh, one of the sperm cells has the same frequency as one of the eigenfrequencies of the uh, 
uh, zona pellucida molecule or uh, one area, one part of this structure. Okay, these are already existing uh, models. So half space model, layered model, shell model, and so on. Uh, they are based on their experimental results uh, of the micro pipette probing. And uh, here is also the Hertz model, Shadon model. Uh, if you want, I will, I will send uh, the, the papers regarding these models uh, uh, together with the abstract of, of this, um, this talk. Uh, also, uh, yeah, uh, what was, so you see uh, that uh, this is uh, from um, uh, scanning an electron microscopy, and this big one is a uh, oocyte, and it is much, much bigger. It's, it, it behaves like uh, inert mass uh, in this system, so it doesn't move, and it is a cess cell, so it is big. Uh, compare, it is the biggest cell actually, despite neurons, but uh, in humans it's uh, 100 micrometers, uh, the match row site. And the sperm cells are very small and very tiny. And uh, uh, as you can see, like this, there are dots. These dots are actually uh, attached to the surface of the oocyte, but only one will pass in um, physical conditions. Um, in, um, in natural conditions, uh, you could not actually, in reality, have the fertilized egg just with one sperm. So it's not possible. It's possible in the lab when you put in the needle one sperm and then inject directly to the outside and put in the citrus. But in that case, when you do not have nothing, <laughs> just one, um, the Natural selection is off. You do not know what is the quality of the genes inside the sperm cell you put into the egg. You will know if it's good if you look the first uh, and the second uh, division uh, by looking at the microscope, are the, the embryo is healthy? Do you transfer them? So the biologist will decide if this embryo, looking at it through the microscope, the number of the cells, they are shaped, they are uh, how they look like uh, in between. So this embryo is healthy, we can transfer it and, and expect to have the healthy offspring. But in the nature, to have normal, you need the minimal quantity of the sperm cells to, 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 uh, for the event. So some parameters, uh, as I remember, are uh, were uh, 20,000 per milliliter. So less of that, there are problems, fertility problems in humans. And what is also uh, interesting, that that number of the normal sperm uh, cells in, in, in uh, eaculate uh, is decreasing as the development of um, uh, the world increase. So it is a negative, in a negative correlation. Why is it so, a way of... Uh, uh, living, uh, food of eating, uh, it, it, it's not uh, clear. So it's just the speculations, what is, what causes this? But for the, uh, let's say, average uh, uh, human in 21st century, it is 20,000 per milli. Uh, and um, why is this important? Because uh, if you have also in a Petri dish, you need certain amount. We do not know what is the way, as uh, Rafael yesterday said, whom he uh, which one she chooses. We do not know. <coughs> what are the parameters? Um, is the all side chooses the best, the, the, the fastest one? <coughs> it should be because it has to come. If it's not. Uh, speed enough, others will come. But also there is a theory that you need um, to move the mass, to change the, not just the electrical charge of, of the oocyte because it's involved in the process of fertilization, but also to have some kind of 
to cover all the receptors on the outside surface. And also from the physical point of view, um, to have enough kinetic energy transferred to the outside to change its conformational structure, uh, conformational and structural uh, structure of the of the uh, envelope. <coughs> so that's why uh, probably the amount of the sperm cells are important. So they all contribute. It's uh, according to my opinion that all the all of them contribute to the specific oscillatory state of the oocyte that is necessary for the fertilization. But only one will come. Which one? We do not know. What is the, the kind of selection? We do not know. It, for now, it's stochastic. But uh, is it also important, the, the, the structure and the weak spots on it? And what are the parameters that uh, we can use to determine, to determine, to determine what is the, the, the weak spot, how to find the weak spot? Uh, also, uh, this is this is to represent that uh, equal distribution and non-equal distribution, and each of the sperm cell will uh, have specific impact uh, to the oocyte. So there are one or two or many possibilities for this uh, modeling and for this outcome. <coughs> of course, if you use uh, symmetrical one, you uh, make yourself easy for the calculation. You do not put too many complexity in the system. So these are the approximations. Uh, the model. So chains cross sect. Uh, this orange should be the uh, ZP1 molecule, and the uh, blue and the uh, green are ZP2 and ZP3. Uh, the arrangement, uh, yeah, they are connected like chains and they are uh, can um, oscillate in a, a meridian and um, uh, equatorial direction, so in both axes and in radial direction uh, because they are attached to the surface of the oocyte. So um, I would just mention that we got the different, during the modeling, actually, the results were that uh, the sperm number will give you different, uh, different, different outcomes of the lysergic curves uh, of the uh, molecules that are oscillating in the simple quadrant of the simple one segment of, of, of the net. So if you have four of them, if you have three of them on the knots, acting on the knots on the ZP1 molecules, or just two, it is also important of their symmetry, but it is um, due to the model. It is due to the model. And if it's one. Also, you can use a different approach to this problem. So uh, to model the zona pellucida, not like a net, but uh, like an uh, empty shell, and uh, to have the symmetrical distribution, and then to calculate the uh, um, not the forces, but um, um, the formation work of the structure. And uh, uh, then you can uh, have uh, uh, the different values if the ZP structure is thicker or is thinner, uh, because it is also important for the pro process of fertilization. So if it's thicker, then you got infertility. If it's the right, uh, it usually happens. So it's uh, in, in the biological system, it's not thinner than it's usually. So uh, uh, frequent, more, more frequently happen that it's thicker. For example, if, you're, if the woman smokes, then the, it has a thicker oocyte, uh, ZP zona pellucida, and it could be one of the reasons for the infertility. It's not uh, causal, but it's somehow related. Uh, and the, these are the graphs uh, uh, of. Uh, how the, the, the thickness of the ZP uh, can uh, be related uh, with, uh, with the deformation work uh, of the structure. Also, uh, this um, work was, uh, was done with my colleague, who is in mechanical engineering, during, uh, uh, very good in um, uh, ANSYS uh, simulations and so on. And uh, we did this um, uh, 
modeling in his lab. It was uh, to model uh, the contact of the one sperm cell to the oocyte, and we model it to be the friction contact. So it happens in the, uh, in the liquid, in the water. I mean, liquid, that liquid has, has parameters like water. And uh, what will be if we change the angle? So uh, what is the, because there was one paper, very uh, nice, uh, that um, uh, asked the question, there were models that uh, test what is the force that one sperm cells will uh, um, transfer to the oocyte, but they all use that it. it is uh, uh, perpendicular. So, but the experimental results, when you can see it's not perpendicular in the, uh, when you see through the microscope, it's uh, life with arc. So if you have, uh, for example, this is the oocyte and it has uh, oblique path. And we want to explain this. So uh, it's not uh, uh, corresponding the theoretical and the, the experimental results. And um, I think it's for the bishop. I also stand if you are interested in that uh, paper. It's very interesting. Uh, he was explaining the story why it's oblique path because the sperm cell will try to uh, not to have, because when it passes, it doesn't make a, a, a hole is not uh, formed. So it passes and everything is then healthy, uh, covered. There is no hole from, from that. So it passes really smoothly. And what is the reason? And uh, uh, through this modeling, we actually found that, that if the angle is smaller, so uh, uh, the force is less. And somehow the sperm cell is using and, and the, um, uh, the formation and the, uh, the formation of the structure is less and uh, the um, um, force, the, the force that uh, uh, oocyte is making to, uh, as a reaction of the penetration is less. So, um, Somehow, you know, the sperm cell have to sneak inside. If it's uh, too hard, it will make uh, the oocyte to resist. And this is uh, what is confirmed by the probing experiments. Uh, so if you press it so hard, then you got the harder um, response. If it touches gently, then it's softer. So it's somehow, yeah, uh, you are laughing. It's all like you are dealing with uh, with the women. So if you are, you know, pressing too much, she will just kick you out. If you are, no, find the ways to to find the right way to, to her heart, then she will let you to give you the opportunity. I'm joking, but it is really corresponding, you know, uh, and. Um, yeah, the, uh, it's not just the receptors, but it's also that the force, the resistant force of the, uh, it's not big. So we then change the angles and, uh, and what is also important, it's honest for my side to tell, that that effect on the surf, it's really on the surface superficial. So it's not impacting the cytoplasm. Uh, we use the parameters from the experimental results. We use the uh, model, the shape, exact shape from the anatomical uh, uh, articles uh, where, where you have the anatomical uh, numbers of the sperm and so on. And, and uh, when you uh, from the articles that uh, uh, measure the speed of the sperm cells. So the speed is also co connecting uh, with the with the quality of the sperm. Uh, and also a lot of questions arise from this because we do not know if those who swim faster have that kind of angle. We do not know that still. So is this correlated? If, if they have some kind of better attachment, we do not know that. Uh, and uh, since the data we obtained also, 
the angle was related uh, in uh, this uh, simulation with the um, time of decreasing the speed of the sperm cell. So if the angle is lower, it's for the 10 degree, it decreases, but it, at the end, it could last longer. It uh, uh, loses its speed, uh, uh, not earlier, but before. It, um, after it, it, uh, the sperm cell need more time to lose its speed and its quality if the angle is uh, lower. And if the angle is 90 degree, you see very fast, goes to zero. And um, this graph uh, represents uh, uh, the um, ZP stress, equivalent ZP stress, and uh, during the time regarding the, the sperm impact angle. So the shapes of the curves are more or less the same. Uh, but uh, for uh, 90 degree, you see, it's not that we got the results there black and white. So certain combination of the parameters of the angle and the speed uh, can give the positive out outcome. But it's not um, strictly this or nothing. Okay. Uh, yeah, and you can use uh, the uh, relaxation oscillations of, we then propose that the mechanism of penetration could be the oscillation, uh, uh, oscillations of relaxation. So come and go, come and go, and then to make that oblique path smoothly. As I have, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, what's, what's also the point? I would like to show a short movie, Sper, polyspermy block. I could not, I mean, it's a really short time in one hour. Uh, so when the one passed, then the changes in the structure, first electrically, in the first place, electrical change in the ZP structure, and a change its uh, um, stiffness and make a block that any other sperm cell will be repelled. So uh, this is very important. It is a um, um, study uh, mostly on the sea urchin, and uh, uh, it is important uh, because the quantity of genetic material stays the same in each generation. So there is no polysperm. Uh, once uh, uh, one a uh, complete of the genes from the mother and one from the father. And that, uh, 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 that's important. It's made, uh, this is first record in 2012 by the Japanese group of scientists. And they, can I repeat? This? So this one, the leading sperm will penetrate, but this will stay outside. And uh, you can see here, there are much, there are a lot of them, uh, see, it's penetrating, but it will be moved apart. So it is electrical event that goes in fast and slow and so on. It's also a, a, a very, very big story. And uh, as I do not have time, I will then just mention, okay, you can still then study to synchronize. You can use a, a different um, approach to study zona pellucida. Uh, you can consider it as a mechanoresponsive polymer since it has such kind of a structure, like an analogy with other mechanoresponsive polymers. And we did not make uh, such uh, uh, model. So if you're interested, we could put it together. Also, it will be interesting to, um, uh, to, 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 to study the uh, thermal effects and the uh, um, the whole thing uh, from the point of thermodynamics. So it's neglected in uh, the research of this structure, but it's very important. Uh, I planned to speak about an oscillatory model of mitotic spindle, but yeah, the time is short. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll speed up. So. Arrangement of the chromosomes, is it stochastic or not? 
how they arrange. Uh, is the frequency of the centrosomes, the structures that organize all these mitotic changes, are same or not? And they're very important. It's one organelle that divides before the process starts, uh, make its position in the cell, be opposite on the poles. It's not always uh, symmetric on the poles. It, if it moves, that will govern the that alignment and differentiation of the cells, actually. And uh, also, the chromosomes do not have uh, their different size. They carry different quantity of genetic materials. And that genetic material, uh, it's not active equally on each of, of them. Actually, the genes that are um, active in the process of mitosis are only related to the uh, mitotic apparatus. So the other genes are not active. They're packed in chromosomes and they're inactive in order to be transferred to the new cell, divided. <clears throat> but the genes which are active in that process are related to the mitotic stimulus. And there are many, many, many proteins, not just microtubules, not that, just centrosomes, uh, which are discovered by the molecular biologists, by the uh, genetics. And uh, it is not always clear what are their functions. So what we have, we have separate research for different molecules. And um, it's hard to model this, the whole structure. And there are models who uh, can explain how the steps are made how the microtubules are extended, how they are uh, elongated, how they are shortened, uh, what are their uh, mechanical properties, and that their mechanical properties differ uh, regarding the phase of the cell cycle. So they're not uh, elastic equally in, all, uh, in each phase. Uh, OK, so that's why uh, we want to make one one, okay, <laughs> I will just mention. So uh, the model consists of, uh, it is imagined as a system of coupled oscillators. Uh, these are um, centrosomes. They are um, considered as aeronomic centers of oscillation. So they generate the oscillations. We do not know how, but we uh, make the model. So that these are the oscillation starts here. And uh, each, um, this is the pair, the sister chromatids. Uh, they are interconnected with the, with the spring that represents the uh, chromatin fiber. And uh, these one uh, are also strings that represent the microtubules connected to the uh, chromosomes. And then the, uh, this one can be modeled uh, not just a spring, but as a viscoelastic element. And you always can consider it as a max, max for model, it depends what you want. But you can model this as a viscoelastic elements because they change their uh, elasticity during, during the process of mobility. And the point is when this can divide and how this can elongate. And what we, I would just mention this, and uh, maybe we can stop. Uh, and uh, if you're interested during the break, uh, the point was to calculate the energy of oscillations and to find uh, uh, in which uh, conditions this will bring, this will break, and uh, that uh, uh, we consider that the resonance is uh, the condition for um, breaking. <clears throat> it's, um, yeah. But if something happens, if we break here, and then we have the chromosome aberrations. Uh, also, in this model, we um, change the places of chromosomes. In the center, put the most heavy, and then to put the others, uh, the, the lighter on, on the periphery of the mitotic spindle. And this is model that is valid only in the metaphase, only when the chromosomes are aligned, like here. And we got a different results. And we got different results when these ergonomic centers have equal frequencies of and when they're different. So the oscillate, the energy of oscillations are not the same. So I will just <coughs> skip this. Yeah. 
So you have curves like this. It's um, separate for, let's say, first 10 who are in the uh, middle. Uh, if, uh, if, if the center zones oscillate with the same frequency. So it's oscillatory, but the amplitudes of each, uh, um, the maximum amplitude is the same, always. But if the center zones are, are, okay, are not oscillating with the same frequency, you have uh, energy. It uh, is more or less the same pattern for uh, potential and kinetic energy and for the total energy. And what is also important that potential energy contributes according to the model more than the kinetic energy to the system. <clears throat> And what is also important, uh, when you put the heavier one in the center, you got the lower amplitude. So the energy consumption is lower. And we believe that uh, the system is uh, governing by the minimum of energy spending. But we do not know that. So we need experimental proof. So for now, it's a fairy tale. <laughs> that is based on the experimental data and of our modeling. But I have to be honest, this have to be proven. Okay. <clears throat> uh, this is um, improvement of the model because one of the reviewers uh, um, mentioned, okay, your system is in vacuum, that's impossible. Where is uh, the friction forces? So we had the friction force and uh, we consider that the cytoplasm is viscous fluid with a slow Reynolds number. And uh, yeah, we have to prepare this. It's new, <laughs> the numerics. But uh, what is also important, uh, what we want to, to prove. So it is also the hypothesis that if the chromosomes have to move in such a dense environment, that will last forever. So probably there is some kind of a trick Maybe also uh, oscillations of uh, relaxation or another kind of trick, the state of the, 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 because the cytoplasm is a net, there are other many molecules inside. It changes its, probably, it changes its structure during the cell division. Otherwise, you could not move. You imagine that you're moving through the air and you have to go to the swimming pool like this and you have to move. So your, uh, your speed will be less. It's also for the chromosomes, right? Yeah, and we want to find a way how to measure the energy. Does the energy of the whole cell change? So like you have in the room, so each of one is in each position and have some kind of energy. If, if I uh, make a photo, you will be like this. So have some kind of uh, uh, thermal print of your positions. And if you change places and I, Market benefit. The question. Huh, okay. Okay. Which kind of coupling machine between oscillators is generally considered to study metallic spinning? Uh, in this case, um, in this case, uh, uh, the coupling is um, by the centrosomes. So it's not. It's not, you know, parallel connections like in circuits or or um, or um, along. So uh, they're coupled by the renomic centers. That's the coupling scheme. Scheme. I skip them. <laughs> they were in the in the okay. So uh, then, to, to, uh, may I just then show the slide where the oscillations, the equations of oscillation? Help me, please. Yeah, one second, please. 
I'll stop. I So, uh, I skip this because of the time, but these are the equations uh, that um, this is for the velocity of the upper uh, and uh, the chromosome, the sister chromatid that is down. And this is the equation uh, that describes uh, the elongation of the, um, uh, the chromatin fiber that interconnects uh, the two sister chromatids. And um, when you put this into the kinetic energy, you sum actually mm -hmm. the whole kinet of each of the oscillator uh, in the system. And this was done for, uh, uh, there are 20 because there are 20 in the mouse cell and the data was uh, used, the masses of the chromosomes were used for the mouse uh, cells from the, from the testicles because there will be only data available in the literature that we found uh, for, for the mass of the chromosomes. And then you, uh, then you uh, sum the uh, kinetic energy and the potential energy of each one plus uh, the uh, each chromosome, uh, sister chromatids plus uh, the potential energy of the interconnected chromatid fiber. Uh, so these are the equations of motions. If one is in, I skip them because of the time. <laughs> I mean, I believe we had one question. Okay, was... okay, one more question, and then we can continue during the break. Is it okay? Yeah, please ask now. I mean, <laughs> uh, we include that in the through the so chromosomes are treated like uh, uh, masses with the spheres. So you uh, yes, we do not uh, count their shape because the shape will also be important if we. Uh, have a model uh, uh, where we uh, treat the cytoplasm as a as a viscous fluid. So then the shape moving in the fluid will 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 have uh, the impact on on the energy and the oscillations and on the friction force also. So in this case, we do not treat that the chromosome itself is oscillating. Mm -hmm. So it's oscillating through the whole system like a mass that is moving along the micro microtubule fiber. Yeah. So yeah, that was the approximation also. So one could think it would be different if chromosomes if they were oscillating themselves, right? That will complicate the model. That could be a stochastic model yes. if yeah. if and they are assumed to be stochastically aligned in the yes. in the core. Okay, I'm really sorry because. <laughs> okay. Thanks for your nice presentation. I feel I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, mechanical part. I would love to have this slide. Okay, I will send. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Thanks yeah. for the suggestion. Okay. Okay, I, we will send uh, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening. I hope Okay. Okay. Uh, can you repeat again, please? On this graph, the same pattern, but it is uh, the sum of it. It's uh, for each 
of the oscillator in the system. It's not for the total. So each of the um, so each pair of uh, sister chromatids they are connected in the metaphase and uh, through the microtubules and the uh, renomic centers, the centrosomes. So the graphs you are shown is for each of these of these twenty for the mouse chromosomes. And yes, they show the same because you know mass does not contribute much because it's really slight difference between uh, masses of the chromosomes. What contributes to the difference is the angle, the position of the chromosome in the structure, according to the model. And we assume that that angle is not changing during the uh, metaphase and anaphase uh, uh, of, of the cell division. So when it takes the position in the metaphase plate, it's keeps the position in a way that it goes to the one or to another centrosome part. We, we saw um, uh, that Eva Tolich show some animations that uh, in a 3D. So this is the planar model that assumes that uh, the position of the centrosome does not change, that is not, not rotating during from uh, uh, um, when they start from the metaphase plate to the anaphase, when they uh, separate, they do not uh, change that position in, in, a, in a plane. Could you louder, a little bit louder? I can hear you from here. No, 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 uh, no come and just, just speak louder. Speak louder. I could not it. hear the, the question. Uh, okay. They have the same pattern, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the way the amplitudes are just different. Um, that means, in general. in general sense, it means that uh, the pattern of oscillations and the type of oscillator does not change during this process. So, uh, but um, I could not tell you uh, in the way uh, for this, for example, this will change if the uh, if the centrosomes do not oscillate with the same frequency. So uh, it's some kind of nonlinear pattern. Uh, and what will in in the biological system different weak frequency will mean that uh, that the cell division exactly won't uh, won't be exact uh, in a way uh, okay let me find the right words so if if you have such kind of a pattern uh, compared to this one this difference in frequency will change the position of the uh, cleavage plane it could affect the differentiation process. So that alignment of the cell, the smooth uh, positioning. Also, we believe that the arra if arrangement is different, so if you put the uh, heavier chromosomes in the center, you will have the different uh, energetical uh, um, the, the amplitudes are different. The pattern is the same. You are right. The amplitudes are different in the way uh, 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 compared to the uh, situation when you put the uh, heavier at the at the side. So that kind of difference, the positioning of the chromosomes, can change 
the energy pattern of the cell. But what really happened, what governs the pos different position of chromosomes in the cell during cell division, we do not know. Because you have some kind of uh, 27 percentage of um, the same, uh, same alignment of same chromosomes, but not in the 100%. So for example, I'm going with uh, Bogdan, uh, five times, we are going out five times per week, but two times I'm going with someone else. Why? We do not know. <laughs> I mean, that's similar with the chromosomes. Why it's not always this way? There's some law that is still not discovered by, uh, which governs all the process. And at this moment, we do not have the equipment to measure the energy of the subcellular structures to, let's say, validate the model or just the theory, correct the model. So let's say this is the, what, we, what we obtained through the model, through the equations, and through, uh, uh, let's say, the theory of elasticity, theory of, of, of uh, uh, mechanics on the macro scale. Yes. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. On the surface of the outside of the zanapelucida. Okay. Okay. Uh, actually, they put uh, with a tiny, uh, not a needle, but a pincet, the uh, AFM, yes. Uh, oh, this was not the AFM. Uh, I have to check. I have to check. Is it imaged by the FM? But I, I, I think, no, it was by the scanning microscope. FM does not give you such kind of uh, uh, high uh, 3D structures density. I can send you the article. Like just... Yes. Uh, um, no, not in uh, each case. If you, if you do the probes in the water, in the liquid, you keep a cell alive. But if you put the cell on the microscopic plate, you kill the cell, actually. And what's the of the but how uh, to put the, 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 the chip? And then what, what uh, does the chip is uh, measuring? What is it doing? Chip is measuring the uh, mechanical property of the cell, and chip is detached after uh, certain yeah. moments. So it was, you know, to see if the surface is rough enough to to catch the chip and the chip to stay, and its roughness change as it changes its maturity or the fertilization. And this was the embryo. And this was the embryo. So they put it with a tiny inset uh, through the microscope and just lay down. I can send you the article. It's not an FM, it's not an FM. It's not the FM. I think it's a scanning probe microscope. I would, I am not sure because it was not very well. So. I will check and I will send you, okay? Okay, so the final four messages and I would call it either. Thank you, very nice work. It's okay. Thank you very much okay. also. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>